thanks again for the invitation. This is a lot of fun. I was in the Castlegar one. I'm not sure when that was now. That was a number of months ago. June? June. A good time there. Um, so um, I really enjoy talking about um, physical exam stuff. It's a, sort of more of a hands-on based thing. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to do that when there's a little bit of a larger group, but I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of first an approach to foot and ankle problems, go through a little bit of, most likely there'll be a review for most of you in terms of some of the history taking. And then I'd like to spend the majority of the time actually um, doing a demo of a foot and ankle exam, and Ken graciously has offered to be our, our guinea pig for that. So thanks a lot, Ken. Um, Sorry? Yes, nice ankles. Nice ankles, perfect, good, all right. <laughs> so we'll try to keep this informal. If you do have any questions, then um, feel free to just, uh, to just ask as we, as we go along. So um, just briefly, I don't have any, uh, any conflicts of interest here. Uh, what I'd like to do is, um, like I said, review the approach to some of the common foot and ankle problems and injuries and things that you may see in your office, and then spend the majority of time actually showing you how to do a, a foot and ankle exam that's hopefully going to be efficient um, and highlight the key things that, uh, that I think are important to, to, to pick up. So this is all review for everybody. As we, as we know, someone comes in, we get a history, uh, we do the physical exam. Uh, depending on how much time we have, at the end of my presentation, and I think you have a copy of it, if I'm not mistaken, um, I do have some cases in, um, that I can go through, we'll see how much time we have, and some of that will go into things like the auto ankle rules and that sort of stuff, but I'll leave that as a lesser priority uh, depending on our time. And then some of the plan regarding some of those cases. So first of all, um, this is basically the format that I use when I do my, my uh, foot and ankle exams, particularly at the St. Paul's foot and ankle uh, uh, screening and triage clinic. Um, when I go through my history, obviously the first thing I want to know is where it's sore. This is so important with any MSK problem. If you have a good idea of some of your anatomy, and you know some of the key structures to look at, then your differential is, is, is reduced uh, right off the bat. So if someone says, you know, I've got pain along the lateral side of my ankle, there's only a certain number of structures that are there that can be affected, whether it's the, the fibula or the, the ATFL, the anterior talofibular ligament, the peroneus brevis and longus tendons go there. And if you kind of know those are the main structures, um, then you're, you're, you're in a good position to, to kind of keep moving on. Um, you know, as you'll see, there's this, there's this acronym here, PQRSTAAA. Some of you may remember that. Um, and that, like I say, that's what I use, and it's a good way to make sure I'm not missing anything in my history. So I usually ask about what kind of pain it is. Um, is it a really sharp pain? That often would, would uh, you'd often see that with a more acute injury as well, if someone twists their ankle and they've got the sharp pain, as opposed to sort of an arthritic, sort of dull, ache, chronic, constant type pain. Does it radiate? That may tip you off that there's something going on neurological. Um, is there some radiation of pain into two toes in particular, which may indicate that there may be a Morton's neuroma. For those of you who are familiar with that, it's basically a chronic uh, in inflamed uh, group of nerves that would sit between two of the toes. Um, and so in that case, they'll say, oh yeah, the pain kind of shoots into my toes. Um, I also, I, I want to ask how bad is this pain? Is it just a one out of 10? You know, is it sort of a nagging, lingering type pain or is it a 10 out of 10 where there's something acute going on here? Uh, that may also indicate uh, to you that you have to possibly consider a septic joint, which of course is an emergency. Um, don't see that very often, but it's something that you need to keep in the back of your mind. Um, what makes it worse? Uh, what makes it better? When is it sore? This is really important. If it's, if it's worse with activity, then that would tend to indicate that, well, the differential is quite big for that, but you know, I'd be thinking more along the lines of an arthritic, an overuse type, arthr arthritis, or an overuse type injury, uh, um, an ankle sprain if they're using their ankle, it hasn't been rehabbed properly, um, and of course the mechanism, so the onset, how did it come on? Is it simply that they rolled their ankle, or is this something that there is no, no mechanism? And uh, again, indicating there may be something a little bit more, uh, more chronic in nature going on. So again, uh, what makes it worse? Uh, walking, running, is it worse first thing in the morning when they get out of bed? Pretty classic for plantar fasciitis is the tissue uh, tightens up overnight and then those first couple of steps can be really sore. So that's a classic story for plantar fasciitis if it's really bad first thing in the morning. Um, and there are certain sort of pattern recognition things that uh, with, you know, as you start to ask these questions, you'll develop that. And what makes it better? So does rest help? Does anti-inflammatories help? Um, when they're wearing a good supportive shoe, does it help? 
Does it make a difference in terms of how stiff their sole is? For example, somebody that's got a, an arthritic first toe, first MTP or a hallux rigidus, um, if they w are wearing a shoe that's very flexible, then that joint is constantly bending every step they take and that can make the pain worse. Whereas if they've got a very stiff soled shoe, a good running shoe or a hiking boot, which basically splints that first joint, that greatly reduces their pain. That's actually one of the treatments for a hallux rigidus is making sure that they've got a really stiff soled shoe and you can actually get something called a spring plate. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that, but it's basically a very thin insert that goes inside the shoe. They're typically, I believe they're actually made out of carbon fiber. So it's just a completely rigid plate. It goes in any shoe, stiffens up the shoe, and they get less pain in that, in that first MTP. And then, um, of course, there's also associated symptoms. So we talked a little bit about numbness, maybe something neurological going on, uh, weakness. Um, or fever. So you gotta, again, think, just keep in the back of your mind the, the, the septic joint because that's something that you don't want to miss. All right. Physical exam. So I was actually just yesterday teaching second year medical students physical exam stuff and this is the kind of the, the, uh, the framework that I, that I was teaching them and I use this. This is, this is very practical. So think of looking at the joint for any obvious swelling. Uh, I'll get into this as we do the exam. Feeling the joint, palpating all those key anatomical locations that I was talking about. Um, putting it through the range of motion. Um, functional tests, and I'll demonstrate some of those. It's important to look at flexibility to see if they've got tight hamstrings, tight, uh, tight gastroc, tight soleus, tight Achilles tendons. Um, sometimes foot ankles can actually just be attributed to very, very tight muscle groups. And if they get into a good stre uh, stretching program, that can often help to alleviate the pain. Um, and then some special tests, which I'll, which I'll demonstrate as well, and a quick neurovascular screen, which is, I mean, for what I do, you'll see it's pretty grossly just, you know, it's a, it's a sensation there and all the different dermatomes um, and checking distal pulses and cap refill and that sort of thing. I'm not going to get too much into that sort of stuff today. So just a quick review here of the anatomy, and again, I don't know if there's, there's no pointer here, is there? Uh, no, okay, it's okay. Um, so uh, if you, again, if you kind of know the key the key bones, some of the key structures in the foot, and you go and you kind of target those with your exam, then uh, you're, you know, you're miles ahead. Um, as you may recall from uh, the Ottawa Ank Rules and the Ottawa Foot Rules, I think some of the really key bony landmarks to hit in your exam, um, this particular diagram doesn't show the tibia and the tibia, obviously, but you want to hit the medial and lateral malleoli. Uh, you want to hit the base of the fifth metatarsal, right there. You want to hit the navicular, those are the key spots for as far as um, you know, deciding if you need to get a frac um, an x-ray for a possible fracture. Um, but again, if you can kind of hit the, the key spots, um, and of course across the joint line, the talonavicular, uh, excuse me, the tibio-talar joint, um, then you've got a, that a, I think those are the main, main structures to hit. Here's a little bit more detailed um, a diagram. And some of the key structures here would be this ligament, the ATFL which is the most commonly sprained ligament. So when someone sprains an ankle, that's, you know, probably nine times out of 10, that's the ligament that, that is injured. Uh, and then after that, the CFL is the one over here, and then the PTFL is back there. And so, again, most ankle sprains are gonna be inversion ankle sprains, so that ankle's gonna roll in. The lateral structures are gonna get stretched, and that's when that, that uh, ATFL, CFL, and PTFL can potentially get injured. So if there's something to take away, I think that's a key point right there. Um, along the medial side, ankle sprains are much less, uh, much less common, but there's a sort of a fan of ligaments here, which is collectively the deltoid ligament. And I think that, if, if you know, for your purpose, I think that's, that's just fine. Um, and then uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the soft tissue stuff as we go along, but obviously the Achilles tendon is back here. It actually anchors quite low down. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that's good for now for there. So, um, I'm just going to put this up so that you have an idea of what I'm going to do with the physical exam and, and then I'll actually come back to this and we can just have it there as a reference so that you can see what I'm doing, you can follow along. Inspection is very important, uh, as I'll demonstrate all of this in a moment. So I'm going to look at the gait, um, varus valgus um, uh, alignment of the legs, and then, um, I didn't put that up there. In, but uh, what we'll also look at is the arch, the, uh, the, whether the person has a pes cavus foot or a pes planus foot. Um, you know, you, you often hear people commenting on the arches, but why is that really relevant? And if you think about it, the mechanics. So if someone has a pes planus foot, so the, this is kind of my foot, right? 
and the pes planus foot is sort of collapsed medially, then everything along the medial side of that foot, so everything that kind of is coming down here, the tibialis posterior tendon and so on, that's actually getting stretched. So that puts stre strain on all the medial structures. Similarly, if you've got a cavus foot, what happens is relative to a person with a normal foot, the outside of the foot is, is being stretched. It sort of changes the dynamic of the foot. So you'll often see lateral uh, problems with the foot. So that's something that can kind of tip you off as well as where, you, where you're going with that. I think what I'm going to do is just, I'm going to kind of go through this very briefly. I'll skip through this and I'll, I'll talk about these in more detail once we get Ken up here and we'll go through that. And then I'll demonstrate what I'm doing. What I will just comment on is just some of the special tests and so we can explain why I'm doing those and then when I do them then I think you'll have a better framework. So anterior drawer, um, so this is getting back to that ATFL, very, very common injury, ATFL tear. And it's, this is basically like doing an anterior drawer, the principle is the same when you're doing an anterior drawer for the knee. And so as you'll see, we, basically you can do this with the patient supine or sitting uh, with the foot relaxed, 20 degrees of plantar flexion and with the knee flexed at 90 degrees and the idea is to actually loosen up the gastroc, um, the soleus, so that that isn't actually limiting your exam. And then you're basically just, like the diagram shows, you're just pulling directly forward on the, on the, on the hind foot, on, behind the heel, and you're stressing that ATFL, and you're looking for a lot, basically, translation of that, and that would indicate that you've got some kind of tear in the ATFL. Another test, and this is to look for that CFL, the second most injured ligament, is to, I've got all the, basically the, the setup of the patient there, but the idea behind that is that you're going to simply move the ankle into inversion and feel for any laxity in the inversion versus the other ankle. Now it's very important when you're doing this as with all MSK stuff to compare side to side because people are going to have different degrees of laxity just normally. That's going to be their degree of laxity. So um, you know you may feel oh that feels a bit lax and you go to the other foot and it actually feels quite similar and so then that would be normal. So you have to always um, uh, compare side to side. So that's what I've got there compared to the contralateral side. And then the other one uh, that you're probably familiar with is a Thompson test. And this is where you get the patient prone or on their knees so that you can look at the back. And basically you're squeezing the soleus muscle and looking for plantar flexion of the foot. If there's any disruption of the Achilles tendon, you squeeze that, there's no connection and the foot doesn't move. And that, uh, um, a ruptured Achilles is something that you well, hopefully don't want to miss because these need to be dealt with right away. Um, if they're not dealt with right away, then there can be, the outcomes generally aren't very good. So, Ken, we'll get you to come on up here. Ken's doing the first thing that I need all my patients to do, and that's expose the lower leg. So he's rolling up his jeans. If they know in advance, uh, we get them in shorts. Otherwise, we actually have a supply of shorts that we get them to just change into. Um, so that's great. We've got his, uh, his legs exposed, his feet exposed. And what I'll get you to do, First of all, I'm going to get you to stand up. Let's have a look with you standing. So maybe we get you to face, face everybody here. And um, I'm going to move around a bit. So again, if you need to move around, feel free to do so. So the first thing I like to do is just have a look at the alignment of the legs and the feet and the arches and, the, and that sort of thing. So um, I like to get right in the front. Can everybody still hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm looking at the alignment of his knees. Ideally, we'd have maybe have the jeans a little bit higher so I can actually see the knees. That's great. And I'm looking for any significant valgus or varus alignment of his knees that may, may put some pressure on, uh, on, well, basically the whole biomechanical chain, but if there's going to be any more stress on the lateral or medial aspect of his, of his foot. Great. Thanks. That's, yeah, that's perfect. Good. And that actually looks pretty neutral to me. Um, then I get in there and I kind of have a look at the arches. Um, you know, it, the, looking at the arches is one of these things that just, when you look at enough, you kind of get a sense for what's, what's flat, what's, what's neutral, what's, what's got a cavus foot. His, I think, are relatively neutral, so that's, that's fine. So I'm not going to be worried about particular medial lateral stress on the foot. Um, the next thing that I like to do is, um, I'm going to get you maybe, to, I'd like to see you walk. I'd like to check your gait. So wherever it's, maybe just walk down this little path here. I always like to look from behind, and then if I get you to turn around and come on back, and I'm looking for, well, first of all, really obvious things. If he's got an antalgic gait, if there's any type of um, uh, unusual uh, walking pattern, making sure that he's hitting the heel, the heel strike, following through, toe off. Some things that you may notice, for example, is a foot drop. And so they won't be able to, to, uh, to uh, dorsiflex their foot. Um, 
if we go back to that example of an osteoarthritic first toe, they may try to walk on the lateral side of their foot, try not to put stress through that first toe, and that may give you a clue what's going on there. So, so that's something I like to do. The next thing I get you to do is, can I get you to turn around? And I want to look at the back of the heel. And in this case, you're gonna ha you have to be directly behind him to see what I'm seeing here. But normally, the hind foot, the heel, does have a little bit of a valgus alignment. And that would be normal. Okay. Um, and what I'll get you to do is, can you go up onto your toes? What you'll note, if, you can, if you're in line there, what you'll notice is that he actually goes into a little bit of varus when he does that, which is what you would expect. And that tells me that his tibialis posterior tendon is working appropriately. To Thanks, Ken. And to stress that even more, what I'll do is I'll get him to do that on one foot. So can you do a single leg calf raise and then up onto one foot? There you go. That, okay. <laughs> and then the other one. Can you go up? Good. And, <laughs> and so, again, that's, that's really stressing his tibialis posterior tendon. It's a very common problem, a tibialis posterior tendon dysfunction. And this will be very difficult for people, that, or, they, or they simply can't do it if they've got uh, a tib post tendon problem. So that's a nice way to, to pick that up. Uh, the other thing that I'll get him to do is to make sure that he's got strength. It's actually just to walk on his toes, okay, and to walk on heels. And that's testing you know, some of his strength of his plantar flexion, his dorsiflexion. It's also a quick uh, neurological screen as well. OK, great. Feel free to stop me. Any questions about that so far? We're good? OK. So um, once I'm kind of happy with that, uh, with him standing, we'll get you to, I might bring the chairs a little closer to the, the front here. Though. And uh, let's get you to, let's put the back of the chair this way, just like that. So you can sit like that with your back supported. And then I might go like, uh, it's going to be tricky for everybody to see you that way. What if we just go a little bit of an angle like that? Can everybody you need to move around? If you, do, if you need to move around, that's... Okay. So um, I've already sort of done that inspection with him standing. But I, again, a quick sort of screen looking for any obvious swelling, et cetera, scars, all that sort of stuff that we all remember from way back. Um, but the next step that I want to do in his, uh, his exam is, is actually look at the range of motion. So I'll get you to bend your ankles up as far as you can. And I'm looking for symmetrical movement there. And bend them down as far as you can. And there's plantar flexion. Good? OK. The next thing I'll ask him to do, can you invert them? It's a little bit more awkward to get a patient to kind of do that. But I usually say, can you just kind of roll your ankles in towards each other? Good. And then this one's even more awkward, sort of out. Yeah? Good. And then while I'm doing that, I'll, it's a good chance to just do the exact same thing, but check the strength. So I'll get you to pull up your ankles again. Resist me here. Keep them up. Good. And down towards me. Push down. Great. OK. Can you roll them out or roll them in? Yeah, we'll do in first, sir. Good. And then roll them out. And so I'm happy with that. I'll also usually test the strength of the toe. So can you push your toe up against my thumb, both sides? Good. And down. Great. OK. So I'm happy there. I've done a quick screen of the range of motion strength. OK. And then the other thing that I like to do is do a, sorry, <laughs> do, a, uh, do a passive range of motion as well, particularly if they're actively reduced. So I'll just get him to relax, and I'm just going to move your feet up through a passive range of motion. So I'm checking dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, inversion, eversion, and comparing to the other side. Particularly if there's a, a reduced range of motion, that's when it's really useful to compare the other side so you can see that difference. Um, along the lines of range of motion, and when you get, to, and again, when you're talking about potential problems in the first MTP, whether it's the hallux rigidus or hallux valgus at Bunyan, it's important to uh, check the range of motion of that toe. So then I'll just say, just relax that toe, and I'm checking to the range of motion there. And I'm always checking to the, uh, comparing to the other side. Okay. The other thing that I get a sense of when I'm doing this is when I'm pulling up, I'm actually getting a sense of his flexibility as well. Uh, because if he's really tight, this will be usually symmetrical, not always, but usually symmetrical. But his dorsiflexion uh, may be restricted, not because of anything going on in the joint, but because I can also actually feel back here that when, the point when his muscle, his, uh, his Achilles tendon and his, his uh, soleus and gastroc are actually fully, fully, uh, fully extended. Okay. Okay. And then I'll get into the palpation, and that's when I talked about just making sure that you hit all the key points, and I think that's the most important thing. So everybody's got their own way of doing it. I like to move, start laterally, kind of come around, come around the top of the ankle, medially, and then move down into the midfoot and the forefoot. So I always come along the posterior aspect of the lateral malleolus. 
That's the key thing for the auto ankle rules, is if there's pain at the, later, at the posterior aspect of the lateral malleolus. Coming down, when I'm here, I can also test the, or I can palpate the uh, pronies longus and brevis tendons, which come down just behind the lateral malleolus. The brevis inserting right there at the base of the fifth metatarsal, which again is a key spot that you need to hit. And then usually what I'll do is I'll come right across the ankle joint, testing for any, any uh, uh, tenderness there. Oftentimes, if there's an osteoarthritic ankle, that's where they're going to feel it, in the ankle joint, obviously. Come across. I'll do the same thing starting coming down the medial side to the medial malleolus, and then palpating, in particular, the tibialis posterior tendon running behind that, inserting into the navicular. And so I've hit the key bony points that I want to make sure that I don't miss. And then it gets into, it's a little bit more you know, specific to what the presenting complaint is, but I will usually kind of do a quick screen of the midfoot bones, just palpating down through all the tarsal and the metatarsal bones. If there's something obviously that's tender, I'll focus a little bit more on that. Yeah. In your office, would you do both sides simultaneously? I mean, I, I find it helpful if you really want to make sure you're not feeling something that's normal. I will. I will. Yeah. I, I, would, I would, usually what I'll do is I'll kind of go through one, yeah. and I'll kind of go through the other. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'll go down. Uh, the list frank ligament is, a, is an important one to, to make sure that you're hitting, which is right at the base of the first and second uh, metatarsal, metatarsal joints. Um, you know, obviously, in the clinical scenario is going to dictate if you're going to spend time there, but that's an injury you don't want to miss if they are tender right at that spot because they can have poor outcomes as well. Um, so I'll go down there. I'll palpate the base of the metatarsals. Metatarsalgia is a very common problem where it's, it's, that's basically a mechanical problem from a lot of pressure. It's multifactorial, whether it has to do with the stance, the arch, etc. But I do want to kind of hit the base of the metatarsal heads on the plantar aspect. Um, I want to palpate, make sure I palpate that first MTP joint, very common site of pain. And then if I am suspecting an aroma, if they've got that uh, history of numbness or tingling shooting into the toes, then I will make sure that I palpate between the toes, just at the sort of the web space there as well, where you'll feel, see an aroma. Um, there are lots of other special tests, but I think if you kind of have done that, then that's, I think that's a good, efficient way of doing it. So then I'll do the same thing on this side, quick screen. So I check the lateral side, coming down, the medial side, across the top of the ankle joint, down through the tarsals, metatarsals, base of the metatarsals, um, into the toe there. Something I didn't do, I always want to check the plantar fascia. So the plantar fascia origin is a key spot right at the medial aspect of the calcaneus. Okay, that's the classic spot. If the pain is more laterally, it's generally not plantar fasciitis. Um, then there's other things there that can be a fat pad or that sort of thing. But the classic spot is, I mean, you can, you kind of just pick the medial spot, spot of the uh, calcaneus and you press on there and that's where they're, they're sore. And then it can extend through the arch, so I'll always palpate that as well. I'll usually do a quick screen of the Achilles as well at that time, palpate posteriorly, but it's better to do that when I've got them prone or on their knees, so I can really have a good look at that. Um, the next thing that I will do is get into some of those special tests that I talked about. So in order to do that anterior drawer, I want the knee, uh, let's bring the chair a little closer, with the knee flexed up at about 90 degrees with a little bit of plantar flexion into the foot. And what I'll do is I'll cup the heel. I use my other hand to basically brace the, uh, brace the anterior part of the ankle and I'm just drawing it forward. And that feels, there's a little bit of motion there, but again, you know, is that, is that relevant? I need to check the other side. So I come over here. And I feel a little bit of there. And so this is what I'll do. I'll go back and forth if I need to to sort of d convince myself if there's anything different. And I think they feel pretty similar. There's a little bit of laxity there. And I, I know Ken mentioned to me that he has sprained both of his ankles. But they actually feel quite symmetrical. So um, is it clinically relevant? You know, that's when we go back to the patient and talk to them, see, see what's going on. Um, so that's the anterior drawer. In that same position, I can check the CFL. So again, that's a, that's a lateral ligament going from the calcaneus to the fibula. And there I just, I'm basically inverting the foot. It's, it's very similar to when I was checking range of motion, but the difference is I need to make sure he's in the correct position for this so that nothing else is, is preventing that motion. And I come back to the other side. And those feel pretty similar too. OK. Any questions so far? We're doing good. OK. We lost that. All right. Usually when I've got the patient sitting up or, or uh, supine at this point, I will do a quick neurovascular screen. And like I say, it's very gross here unless there's a particular reason to do more. And what I'll do is, first of all, I'll just check his uh, distal pulses. 
posterior tibial dorsalis pedis pulses, make sure that those feel fine. I can check some of the cap refill in the toes, and I can just grossly check the sensation. So can you feel that? Does it feel symmetrical all the way across? But, okay, all right. And then I've pretty much done my exam, okay? With the exception of the back. So I'm gonna get you to maybe just go on your knees if you could. Yeah, perfect, okay. So here's a chance now to look at the posterior structures. So again, I'll go up here maybe. Um, gastroc, as you may recall, goes above the knee. So when he's actually got his knee flexed, I'm taking the gastroc out of the picture here. If his knee was extended, that can actually, um, uh, when that's fully extended, then that can actually restrict some of the range of motion. There's some subtleties in terms of being able to figure out if they have a tight gastroc versus a tight soleus, and that has to do with whether they're flexed or extended. But I think for the purpose of this, we're gonna just focus on what I do here with the Achilles. And so basically, I will do some palpation here. So if there's Achilles problem, then obviously I'll get the patient to let me know if there's any pain. Um, there's a bursa that sits a little bit deep to the Achilles, so I always wanna check that. And then that Thompson test. So basically just squeeze, and I can see, oh, there's a great result there. Both the feet move. So your Achilles is in good shape. This is a very, very typical case. I'm, some, I'm sure something that everybody here has seen. Um, the typical sort of, you know, athlete that's out there playing and they've rolled their ankle. And in this case, so this scenario that I've presented is that this is somebody that's constantly doing this. So they've got multiple right ankle sprains and the most recent one was one week ago. So if I just kind of take you through briefly um, what we talked about already in terms of history and so on, that's basically the history that this person gives you, okay? So they rolled their ankle inward Again, uh, inversion, which is the typical one. Uh, the pain along the outside of the ankle, kind of where I would expect it to be. Aching, etc. the severity ranges from four to seven. Um, he says he was able to weight bear for a few minutes at the time of the injury, uh, but the pain got worse over time and it became immediately swollen. So I just want to highlight that point about the weight bearing. Um, if they're able to weight bear immediately and it gets worse later, that's a that's one piece of evidence that you can use that would tend to point you away from a fracture. Typically, if they fractured their ankle, they won't be able to weight bear immediately because it's fractured. Whereas if it's an ankle sprain, sometimes they can get up, they can continue to walk or sometimes play, and it gets worse, and that's as the inflammation and the swelling is starting to set in. And that's why on the auto ankle rules, that's one of the, that's one of the um, distinguishing factors in terms of whether or not they need an x-ray or not. So on physical exam for this guy, um, he's got some lateral ankle swelling, some bruising. You can, you, uh, just, just to comment on that too, it's not unusual to see bruising. You probably have all seen this. That's at the ankle, but it also kind of goes down into the toes. Um, it's not because they've injured the toes. It's basically just gravity, pulling the blood down into the, to the distal aspect of the foot. Um, so he's tender around the anterolateral aspect of the ankle. Um, he's got some decreased range of motion. Um, I didn't demonstrate this one, and it's, it's kind of a, an interesting one, the a single leg stance. So what you can do for this, um, it's also a really good way to convince patients of the benefits of physiotherapy. Um, what you can do is you can get them to stand on their good ankle with their eyes closed for 10, 15 seconds. And then, assuming they can actually wait very well enough to do that at, at, the point, at that point of, uh, of a consultation, but then you get them to do it on the other one with their eyes closed, and typically, they can't do it, or their balance is extremely poor. And the idea behind that is that after an ankle sprain, your, your sense of proprioception is very much affected. And that's one of the problems with people like this, where they have recurrent ankle sprains. It's that they've never actually done the appropriate therapy to kind of regain that sense of that proprioception. And so it's a really good way to show them that you just simply don't have the, 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 the same kind of control on the, on the affected foot as you do compared to your good foot. And the only way that you can really get that back is by doing therapy and working on balance and strengthening and that sort of thing. Um, so that can be a kind of a useful little tool to, to have them do. If, you, if anybody here has a poorly sprained ankle, a poorly rehabbed ankle sprain, you should try this later on and see. It's quite interesting. Um, so uh, we check flexibility and then on the exam, he's got a positive anterior drawer. So I'm thinking an ATFL. He's also got a positive Taylor tilt, so possibly a CFL injury as well. Um, tibial torsion is, I didn't show you that one either. That's, that's if you're looking for a higher ankle sprain. So a sprain between the syndesmosis of the tibia and the fibula. And basically the way you do that is you just get the foot, you kind of anchor the, the, 
the lower part of the leg, you grab the foot and you basically just try to twist the foot. So you rotate the foot. And what I'm doing there is basically seeing if I can stress that syndesmosis and if that causes pain. That's one, one uh, clue that there could be a high ankle sprain. So uh, the question always is, do you need the x-ray? And I'll show you the, the, uh, the requirements for the auto ankle rules. But uh, as, you, as, you, as I'm sure you remember, there's actually three different views of the ankle that you need. The mortise view is really what allows you to have a good look at the joint, which is a slightly uh, uh, angled picture when they do the x-ray. Uh, then you can see the whole joint space. Um, in this particular x-ray, just because I notice it, <laughs> there's a uh, tiny, tiny little piece there. Uh, it looks like an avulsion fracture from the fibula. Um, it could have been an ATFL rupture on this. I'm, I don't know where this x-ray came from. Um, but that could actually have been an ankle sprain with an avulsion fracture. That actually looks like it, it's hard to tell from this, but it could be intraarticular. So that could be causing them some problems. And uh, depending on how they're going to, for, uh, or how they're doing with their therapy, that, that might actually need a CT scan to see where that piece is. So there are the auto ankle rules. So um, I just want to see, I think I have another slide that basically summarizes these in a little bit easier. Yeah, so here we go. So an x-ray is required if there's pain in the malleolar region, so basically pain in your ankle, right? And one of bony tenderness at the posterior edge of the lateral or medial malleolus, um, or the inability to weight bear immediately, gets back to that idea of more likely to be a fracture, um, and at the time of the assessment, okay? And then, um, I think, did I put the foot rules? Yeah, the foot rules are very similar, only the, the, the areas that you're looking at are the midfoot, and tenderness at the base of the fifth, or at the navicular and then they need an x-ray. So that's kind of a, uh, uh, you know, a picture of what's happening in this case with the ATFL injury. It's the most common ligament injury. As I mentioned, these are the most common ones that get injured. Um, I think I mentioned a lot of this already. Um, if you want to get into it, you can actually gray the laxity of that, of that anterior drawer. It's not too crucial. I mean, the point is that you want to identify if there is any laxity on one side versus the other. And so the treatment. So acutely, rest, ice, anti-inflammatories. As much as possible, we want these people to be moving. So they may need crutches. That's simply for comfort. So I, if they have crutches or they need crutches to actually get around initially, I'll basically tell them, as soon as you're comfortable to get rid of your crutches, I want you to get rid of them and start using your ankle normally. Um, sometimes taping. This is really, as far as I'm concerned, is, is the key for ankle sprains. Uh, physiotherapy. Um, strengthening the proprioception I talked about, functional exercises. Um, it's all about strengthening up the ankle and getting that proprioception back. Bracing is kind of double-edged sword. Um, it can be very useful for people that want to get back to their activity and they need that extra support. I don't like the idea of somebody using a brace all the time because it goes against what I just said. They start to rely on that brace and they're not actually strengthening the ankle. Um, but I think it has its role if you're going to use it just, you know, you're going to go back and play a game of soccer or that sort of thing, and I think that's, that's totally appropriate. Um, and surgical referral is actually very rarely needed for an ankle sprain. Even if they've got a completely torn ATFL, um, by doing the appropriate physio, you can rehab it, you can, you can rehab it, and it can, it can, the outcome can be very good. The ones that need re surgical referral are the ones that are constantly rolling their ankles all the time, and they've done that. They've gone through the physio, they've gone through the rehab, and you're confident they've had a really good try at that, and it's just, it's not getting better. Those ones sometimes do need some ligament reconstruction, but it's rare. So how are we doing for time here? Got a couple more, we'll do. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, there's, there's some, yeah, there's a little bit of a trend going that way now. Um, it's hard for me to answer that. I, I think, you know, from my experience, I have been doing it. I, I do it. I try to get that swelling down. I try to get that pain controlled so that they can then get moving quicker. And I want to, I really focus on that. So um, you're right. I know there is some, there's some debate about that now. My personal practice, I, I'm still using it quite early, trying to get them to get moving. So, yeah. Uh, what I've always understood is if you don't restore range of motion, uh, so that you have equal range of motion on both sides, you're susceptible That's interesting. So, so in that case, it, it's in, it would be interesting to go back and ask, well, what did you do for each of those ones in the past? Um, is that what you're saying? Or? Yeah. 
I had a couple of bad ankle sprains. Yep. And then I had a really poor sprain in both of those with equal on both sides, and I've never had a problem. And you have a problem since. That's interesting. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's very good. Um, so I'll just, I have a, I'm going to try to go through these, I think, a little bit quicker, just because I do have a couple other cases, and I think it's useful to, for you to see these and how, how just to get some management ideas. So this one's a, a chronic, uh, chronic ankle pain. One year, uh, gradually progressive pain. Um, it tends to improve with, with rest, worse with walking activity. Um, and this is a guy that's just had, you know, you ask him, have you ever heard it before? And he says, well, you know, I've, I've tweaked my ankle m multiple times over the years. Nothing in particular comes to mind, but that's sort of the presentation. Um, there's some generalized swelling. Uh, he's tender along the anterior ankle, so along the joint line. Uh, it's, it's some decreased um, uh, range of motion, both active and passively. So when I do it, I, you know, I, I actually can't get him into a normal range of motion. His special tests are all negative. Um, but there's a, kind of an idea of what you might see on x-ray, right? So we're dealing with osteoarthritis there. Um, and uh, that, that, that picture is quite severe osteoarthritis. There's, there's, no, there's no joint space there. Sorry? Thunder, yeah. So there's no joint space. You can see he's got all kinds of little uh, bits of avulsion fractures here. Possibly they're osteophytes that have chipped off along the way. Um, anyway, obviously very, very bad osteoarthritis. Um, so this is a guy that, you know, for, for long-term management, it's probably useful to get a CT scan as well, although, you know, you could very well debate that you kind of, you know, you know the CT scan is going more important in terms of the, if there's going to be surgical management here. Um, the x-ray really tells you what you need to know there. Um, I'll just whip through this. You're all familiar with osteoarthritis. Um, yeah, I think I'll skip through that. So how do we manage it? Well, first of all, like similar to, you know, osteoarthritis pretty much anywhere in the body, there's, there's a, a huge range of treatments, everything from conservative to joint replacements. Um, they are doing uh, ankle replacements uh, at St. Paul's. Obviously, the, the, uh, the experience with that and the technology is nowhere near as uh, advanced as uh, knees and hips because it just hasn't been done for as long. Um, but initially, uh, rest, ice, activity modification, um, analgesia, Tylenol. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with this. Um, there are lots of other uh, things. The, the, the glucosamine sulfate, there's conflicting evidence. Um, it's usually one of those things that I kind of leave up to the patient to decide. I don't advise one way or another. Um, so stiff sole, rocker bottom contour helps them through their gait if the, if, the sh if the shoe itself has a little bit of a rocker bottom type shape so that they can kind of walk through it a little bit and their ankle isn't forced to bend as much with each step. Um, um, braces can be, I'm not sure if I have that on here, braces can be used uh, to help support the foot as well, again to kind of lock that, uh, that symptomatic ankle. Chances are there's not a lot of range of motion here anyway and when they do move that ankle it's painful. So we try to minimize the motion there um, by using a supportive brace, but taking away, the, taking away the pain. So you go from a painful stiff joint to a painless stiff joint. That's the goal. And that's actually the goal of fusion, of course, if, if, if it goes that way, is they're taking a painful stiff joint to make a painless stiff joint. Um, there's the ankle lace or boot. Weight loss can be useful. Um, depending on the degree of osteoarthritis, physio may be useful or not. Oh, sorry, no, I was just wondering if that was my signal for, to get down. Um, so, like I say, there's a big range of treatments here. There's conservative, kind of braces, ankle supports, that sort of thing. You can do injections, you can get, and depending on how things go, all the way up to surgical, okay? I'm going to keep moving here just so I can get through a couple. So here's, here's a typical case that I see at uh, the foot and ankle clinic. So, uh, uh, and they're typically women that come in, and they say, I have ugly feet. Those aren't my words. So, and they're concerned about, of course, the first MTP right there, okay? And they want to do something about that. So... So the typical story is they say, I've, got, I've had these, these ugly feet since my 20s, and I'm sick and tired of it. I want to do something about it. They've got some intermittent pain uh, in the first toe, um, aching and so on. The severity is not too great in terms of the actual pain, um, but it is wor worse when they're wearing sort of night, uh, tight or narrow shoes. Um, interestingly, there's no pain when they're in bare feet or when they're wearing runners. Um, and, you know, so this is kind of a typical story. Um, I should say, I mean, there's quite a range there. Sometimes there, there is quite severe pain with the bunions. Um, so I'm just presenting one, one side of this here. Um, uh, there's a prominence of the first MTP, uh, some tenderness when I palpate there along the medial aspect, but not a lot. Um, and so this is what we, do, what we uh, get when we do an x-ray. And the thing that we're looking here uh, in a bunion 
or a hallux valgus is this angle right here, okay? The hallux valgus angle. That and that, but I mean, that is a bunion by definition. It's it's when this. Keep things really simple. It's when this isn't a straight line anymore. These toes, you see, it's a straight line right through the metatarsal to the phalanx, and this is no longer. You've got this valgus deformity. Okay, <clears throat> so very common. Syndromes can can uh, truly vary in severity. Um, it is true that they're they're worsened by very narrow toe boxes. So those pointy issues. Two minutes. Okay. Um, I guess what I want to emphasize with this one is that this is a very common problem, but it's not, the reason to have surgery for bunion is not cosmetic because there are possible complications with foot surgery and the surgeons, I'm not a surgeon, but the surgeons are very clear that they want to maximize these uh, conservative treatments for bunions before going to surgery. They, they estimate that about 10 to 15% of people can have a worse outcome if they are essentially pain free going to surgery and they're doing it for the look of the foot, most of them will do well. But what I always explain to patients is that, you know, if you don't have any pain when you are wearing a running shoe or when you're wearing a, uh, you know, a comfortable shoe when you're in bare feet, is it worth taking the risk of having chronic pain afterwards to have surgery? And that's something that they have to keep in mind. Now, having said that, if there are people that have severe pain all the time in their bunions, regardless of what they're doing, what they're wearing, then those are appropriate surgical referrals. But the, 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 the indication has to be correct. So, this is, so non-operative treatment is using toe spacers, making sure they do have wide uh, shoes, something with a soft uh, contour along the top of the toe box so that they've got some room. Um, basically anything that is going to try to mechanically reduce that angle in the, in the, in the toe. And um, I think I'm running out of time here. I didn't get to your plantar fasciitis one, but I had that on here. And so, yes. So, it's an interesting question. Um, I'll put it this way. So my group at St. Paul's Hospital, uh, where I work at the foot and ankle screening and triage clinic, um, we have, there's a number of people like me that are doing the primary care. Where we do some of the screening. We manage them conservatively if we can. And if we can't, we refer them on to the foot and ankle surgeons. The surgeons that we refer them to are subspecial, subspecialists in foot and ankle surgery. So I'm very confident in what they do. And, and I'm thinking along the same lines as them in terms of the, the types of patients that they're going to want to operate on or not want to operate on. There are some very good podiatrists, and we do work with podiatrists at St. Paul's Hospital, and I will make referrals to the podiatrists for various foot problems. For the bunions, I will refer them to the orthopedic surgeons. Um, I have had, as with anything, I've had some patients come in to see us at the foot clinic who are coming in to get a second opinion, and they've seen a podiatrist, and the podiatrist wants to operate on their foot for a bunion, for example. Um, and this is just from my biased population in the clinic. But when I do my exam, I find there's not a lot of pain. And it gets back to the idea of then, you know, do they actually need surgery and is it worth the risk? And they tell me, well, the, you know, the, the, the podiatrist says they can operate next week. It'll cost me however many thousand dollars and I can get my foot fixed and I'll be happy with the appearance. And I tell them my honest opinion. I say, I, if it was me, I wouldn't do it. Um, I don't think that the pain is great enough to, to do that, and I don't think it's worth the risks. It's your choice. Um, so, you know, my experience with the surgery has been with the orthopedic surgeons. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but, yeah. Well, uh, have you ever seen Gerald on the job, and also Frodo and Lincoln Patrick? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so it depends on the, the scenario, obviously, the clinical uh, scenario. Um, so I will often use some anti-inflammatory gels if I think, you know, some topical stuff, if I think it can uh, penetrate, if it's not a very deep sort of, uh, where I think, if, as long as the pathology isn't too deep and it's more superficial. Um, I do want to kind of get back to the plantar fasciitis because that kind of addresses that question too. So plantar fasciitis, my, my treatment scheme for that typically will be, uh, it also depends how long it's been there, but let's say sort of a more acute, sort of a new onset plantar fasciitis, I will, uh, I will use anti-inflammatories. Um, if they want to try cream, they can use a cream. Uh, I will emphasize the importance of physiotherapy as well for that. Um, stretching, strengthening, a very simple thing to do is to put a, a towel down on the ground and use your toes to grab that towel and curl it up. It's a good way to really strengthen the bottom of the foot. A good way of stretching the foot is to 
uh, put a golf ball in the freezer, make a little round frozen ice pack, put it down on the floor, gently roll your foot over that and kind of put some gentle pressure down and that's a good way to kind of stretch out the plantar fascia while you're icing it. Um, there's other things like a, um, I'll just keep clicking here as I'm talking. Um, there's things like a uh, Strasberg sock or a night splint um, that they can use at night because as I said, it, first thing in the morning, um, here's plantar fasciitis. So first thing in the morning, uh, it tends to be bad as that tightens up over a night. Um, and I'll just bring up, I have a picture I think of some of these modalities that you can use. Uh, there's basically the whole list of things that you can do for plantar fasciitis. Um, the, cord the corticosteroid injections, I'm not too keen on to be honest. Uh, I put that up there for completeness sake. Um, I, what I prefer to do is, um, so I'll try, all the, I'll try all the conservative things first. The stretching, the strengthening, the plantar fascia, uh, Strasberg sock, night splint. Um, if that doesn't work, um, it's a little, I don't know if anybody is doing prolotherapy out here. Um, we are doing it, uh, the radiologists are doing it at uh, St. Paul's. And that is one that I, interestingly, I have had some success with just anecdotally from my patients coming back. Um, so I have referred them for prolotherapy. They do it under ultrasound guidance. They look at the, the actually the status of the plantar fascia and they will, sorry, I'm, I'll get off here, okay. Um, and so, uh, but I have had some, some success with that. Um, and I better get off the stage. Oh. Sorry, how Um, I, I don't use it very often, so I don't, I, I don't know that I could give you a, a number of that. I, the, the rare times I've used it is with somebody that has acute pain and they, they need to be on their feet. I had somebody visiting with Cirque du Soleil once and they needed to be on their feet. And it was like a week, they, their, their performance was a week later and they wanted something to get down that inflammation and they'd had it before and they knew it worked, which is not great because the more you have, that that's kind of gets worse. So I did it that time um, and it seemed to help. But I, I'm, I'm cautious about it. I, if I, I, I kind of steer patients away from it. So. <laughs>